So I recently had an interesting conversation about how to implement the paging of data in an application. And it spurred some really useful insights about .NET and SQL Server that I want to share with you. While this presentation is about paging data, it's really about the trade-offs you can make to improve performance. And in my mind, there's three keys to performance improvement. Know how to measure performance. If you don't measure, how will you be able to assess any changes that you make? Understand the impact of your actions that your code is making. How much memory does your data use? How often is the feature utilized? Is a function operate on a local resource or across the network? And finally, how can you balance the trade-offs? If you use more resources, memory, processing power, etc., in one place, does it make the process go faster in another? And these are some of the things we're going to talk about in the context of SQL paging. So I've downloaded the MPI database of all of the physicians in the US so I can have a reasonable number of rows to work with in SQL. I'll put a link in the description so you can download the data for your own testing. So here I have a simple program that gets a list of last names from the database using a SQL command and a SQL data reader. It doesn't do anything with the data, it just retrieves it. And we can use SQL Profiler in C Sharp to see how different strategies can affect performance. I don't see people talk about this often, but the SQL connection object can collect statistics about what data is moving through that connection. And that's super useful for understanding how the application is interacting with SQL Server. Now the key to improving performance is measuring what an application is doing. So let's look at how we can do this. You can see on line nine that I've set the statistics enabled property on the SQL connection. So I can collect information about how much data has moved from SQL across the network to the application. And once that query has been executed and the data reader has read all the data, I can call retrieve statistics, then print out some of those counters. Now there's a whole bunch of different statistics that you can, you can get. So take a look at the documentation if you wanna learn more and I'll include a link to those below. Now when I run the application, I can see what those counters were. The bytes received value tells us that about 50 megabytes of data were moved over the wire and the select rows value tells us that about 5.8 million rows were returned, and that's a lot of data. Now, if we look at the SQL profiler, we can see what's happening on the SQL server. The two columns we're interested in are reads and duration. They tell us that the query required 174,000 read operations and took about 1.4 seconds. Now, this is our performance baseline, and the goal is to use paging to improve it. All right, so let's try our first strategy to reduce the amount of data that we get from SQL by short-circuiting the data reader. And in this example, I've defined two variables, a start position and a quantity per page to dictate the set of data that will be displayed on a page. The strategy is to only read the rows we need. And in this case, we want rows 50 through 60. So we have to read rows one through 60 to get the data we need. The idea is that calling reader.read will only read the first 60 rows, and that should greatly reduce the amount of data that we move across the network. So let's check the counters. Wait a minute. 60 rows were read, but look at the number of bytes received. That's 50 megabytes of data, and that's way too much for the last 60 names. That means that using a data reader in this fashion can reduce the amount of work you do in the application but you still incur the cost of moving that data over the wire. Now, why is this? This strategy doesn't really reduce the load on the SQL server or the network. Think about it this way. When we send data over a network, we use packets, chunks of data, because if we sent it one byte at a time, the total amount of time it would take would be dominated by the latency of the network. When we execute a SQL command, it returns a data reader, and that kicks off the process of executing the query in SQL Server. It does the work of figuring out what should be returned, and then has to allocate memory to store the result. That data needs to be sent back to the client, but you don't want to return one last name, one row, because the latency is going to make the time increase. It's better for SQL to start sending the data and hopefully getting closer to freeing up that memory used to hold the result set. The reader.read operation on the client waits for the first packet of results, then provides the first row. The read operation is not issuing the command, it's consuming the results. So let's look at a comparison. This strategy doesn't really reduce the load on the SQL server or the network. The value here is that it can reduce what's happening on the client. By simply not processing the incoming data, 
when you have what you need. So let's start with the simplest option I can think of, which would be to page your data based on a property of the data. Grouping people by the first letter of their last name is a pretty common strategy. So I've simply added a where clause to the query to limit the results to those that begin with the letter A. The goal is to reduce the amount of data that we have to move over the wire, and this would be a natural way to slice up the set. So let's run it and examine the performance counters. Ah, when we look at the counters, we can see that SQL had 175,000 read operations, and the time it took was 141 milliseconds. Mm, so that's about the same number of read operations as before, which makes sense because SQL had to read each row and check the last name. Our use of the WHERE clause doesn't make SQL do any less work, but it is faster. I'm going to chalk that up to reading the data from cache rather than from disk. What is significant are the numbers coming from the SQL connection. We moved about two megabytes from the SQL server to the application, and that is significant because moving that data across the network connection is far more expensive than SQL Server reading it from SSD or cache memory on the server. Now, while this is better, it's not always practical. Sometimes we really just want to get the 10 or 20 results because that's all our users will be able to work with. All right, so when we compare the filter by property method, we can see that it didn't improve the amount of work SQL had to do, but it did greatly reduce the amount of network activity. Another option is to include a top clause in the query. This will absolutely reduce the amount of work SQL has to do and limit the data moved over the network. The challenge here is that you need to run another query to determine how many results there are. There's also the potential that the data is changing between each execution of the query, and that might affect how the data is broken into pages. But this could be a good solution depending on your situation. Remember, if you need to display 10 results per page, and the users on page six, you have to get all of the rows from one to 60. As the user advances through the pages, the amount of work increases. So let's look at the counters to validate this idea. Ah, so now we go from transferring 50 megs of data down to 658 bytes, and that's more in line with what we want. And on the SQL Server side, we only had 12 read operations, and the duration was less than one millisecond, which is fantastic but there are situations where this solution doesn't work. Now, when we look at the performance difference, we can see that using a top clause makes a tremendous difference on the amount of work SQL has to do and how much data is sent over the network. So sometimes the cost of running the query is great enough that running it for each page of data is just too expensive. Here, I'm trying to demonstrate this by searching for the string CO in an address column. There's many solutions to this problem, but fundamentally, it means you need to store the results somewhere while the user pages through the data. So the first step is to get a list of all the primary keys for the relevant rows, then store them somewhere. In this case, I'll just put them in a list. And the second step is to create a delimited list of primary keys based on a given page. That happens on line 27. Once we have state, we can simply query by the primary keys for the result set rather than using the top clause. So now we can see that the first query still caused SQL to perform 175,000 read operations because we made it look at every row to find the string CO, and that took 198 milliseconds. Now, most of the data that was sent from SQL Server to the application consisted of the 286,000 primary keys. The subsequent query has only caused 30 read operations, and it's a trade-off between using memory on the web server to store a list of the results and managing state versus the cost of running the query. Where you store that state is up to you. It could be on a web client, a web server, or even a table in the SQL database. The closer that state is to the data, the faster it will be. But storing that state in SQL will mean you'll have to incur the cost of inserting all that data into a table, and that's all about trade-offs. All right, so just looking at the comparisons, it seems like using the top clause is the big winner. But Really, the best technique to use is the one that's best for your situation. Short-circuiting read operations might make sense when the amount of data you have is to have to move is small, but the computation on the client is great. Filtering by property is useful when your data has a property that breaks up in a, in a way that makes sense to your users. And a top clause is fantastic when you don't expect a user to page past the first few pages of results. Caching the results set is ideal when the cost of the query is very high.
So hopefully I've been able to give you some ideas, some insight into how you can measure your data access code and giving you some ideas on how to tackle performance problems when you're paging data.